Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson. You're very welcome to this morning's uh, webinar. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Um, today, I'm joined by Tom Houlihan, who is a forestry specialist in Chagask, and we'll be discussing uh, the role that farm forestry has to play in supporting sustainable development in the Irish agri-food sector. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to give us a presentation for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And uh, Tom is going to uh, give an outline of the important role that farm forestry has to play uh, in supporting agricultural sustainability in Ireland. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> and good morning to all participants. Um, so I'm going to give you a short um, outline, as Mark says, of uh, the role of forestry um, in, in the sustainability process. So um, just to, to get started, um, what's the TOGAS mission? And the mission is to support science-based innovation in the agri-food sector and the wider bioeconomy. And this underpins profitability, competitiveness, and sustainability. So that sustainability is very important. It's a major focus area for agriculture. And I'm posing the question in this presentation, is there a complementary farm enterprise that can be an ally in terms of climate change targets? Is there an enterprise that can have a positive impact when properly um, designed on water quality and biodiversity, and also can provide higher rates of return, maybe in double figures uh, with the right application? So th that's the, the kind of um, range of issues that, that are there. Um, if we look at the, the, the ag, what we call the agri-food knowledge innovation system, and Togask is a key node in Ireland's agri-food uh, system, and I think we are unique internationally in that we combine the three pillars of research, uh, advisory training, and ed education into one organization, and a dynamic uh, system requires a high level of integration, both within Togask and also uh, among our stakeholders, so that's very important. Um, Within the Togas Forestry Development Department, we, we are very integrated as well, and there is uh, two-way communication at all times. And I'm just going to give you, I'm going to just flick through a couple of slides that outlines the range of activities we have. So firstly, in terms of, of research, we have a, a range of projects from tree improvement, species like birch and alder and, and others, breeding for disease resistance, which includes resistance to ash dieback disease, and uh, a, a connected topic would be broadleaf silviculture restructuring um, to optimize growth and, and, and uh, future returns. Other areas would be forest thinning, which is a very important management tool, both in broadleaves and conifers, and looking at the potential of other species, both conifer and broadleaf. Um, we, we have researchers looking at continuous cover systems, uh, particularly in, in conifer, sitka spruce, we're looking at, again, the range of utilizations, and particularly for small size, di uh, small diameter broadleaf trees, there is a pro progress on short rotation forestry, integrated pest management for pine weevil in Ireland, and also looking at the role of, of social networks in knowledge transfer in the Far Own project. So that's just a, a flavor of the range of research. Um, and it's important then that this research is transferred if, uh, efficiently um, to our stakeholders and um, we have an in-house um, capacity that, that does that. So we provide independent advice um, to farmers with a focus on land suitability, how a forest enterprise might be integrated into farms on a sustainable way. We also provide ongoing um, technical advice, objective technical advice on the sustainable management of forests of all ages, and this slide just shows the range of events locally and nationally that, that we um, take part in. Um, as well as that in forestry training and education, and the t t Agricultural College in Ballyhays is a very important resource within the forestry sector. Since 1988, it has provided agricultural education at level five and level, level six, and um, this is QQI um, certified, and it, it, it also is combined with short skills courses as required. So that's the kind of range of activities. And just to get on to Ireland's forest resource and the forestry program um, that, that is administered by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, 
and currently looking at that map there we've got over 770,000 hectares of forestry in Ireland it's 11 percent of the land area and a couple of key um, issues are around that of that area almost half so 378,000 hectares is owned um, privately and this is made up mostly of farmers 83 percent farmers um, and there's about 21,000 own, owners um, of forestry in, in, in the country. We've got a very valuable and export orientated uh, forestry sector worth um, about 2.3 billion and the recent news that we've learned that even with the Brexit challenges the actual export of uh, forest products in 2018 has increased by 14 per, uh, percent which is very encouraging. We've got also a sector that provides over 12,000 jobs and these are evenly distributed in rural areas and more and more there's an awareness and I suppose there's a, a, a requirement now for, to look at multi-purpose forestry delivering ecosystem services. So in the next couple of slides I think it's important for participants to be aware that there's, um, there's a range of forestry planting options there that cater for um, broad leaves, native species, and more commercial species. I just want to go through some of the, the categories. GPCs stand for grant and premium categories. So we've got GPC3, which is a popular category, species like Sitka spruce, but it's mixed in with, with broad leaves as well for added diversity. Um, that's GPC3. GPC4 is diverse conifers, such as Scots pine, one of our native species. Then we're moving to the broad leaves, the GPC6, pure oak, and GPC8 would be the likes of alder and birch, faster growing conifers. And the range of premiums available within these categories is 510 euro per hectare per year for the, the, the conifer, up to 660 euro per hectare per year for 15 years for the broad leaves. Just a couple of more categories, just to set the scene. Um, and there's a growing interest in, in our native woodland resource that's GPC 9 and 10, and it, it's very important. It's in, integral to Ireland's uh, natural heritage, our history and our culture, unique in terms of the range of biodiversity that it provides, as well as ecosystem services. And you can see there that there's very attractive grants and premiums, I won't go into the detail, uh, available for woodland establishment. There's also a conservation scheme for woodlands, and I think there's a commitment by the government to increase conservation of, of, of native woodlands by, by um, a number of, of, of factors by 2020. So that's the, na the native woodland and a couple of, of, of other ones. Agroforestry is GPC 11. And this is a, a, a new system that, um, that's been piloted for a couple of years, silvopastoral, which it combines both forestry and pasture, as you can see from the, the images there. So it has a range of benefits. Again, I won't go, go into detail on this, uh, on, but they're on the screen. You've got continued access to the land, you've got reduced chemical and fertilizer inputs, good animal welfare, and then you've got the ecosystem services as well, as well as providing high quality broad leaves and carbon sequestration. So multiple benefits there for agroforestry. And the last one I'll cover is forestry for fiber. By the year 2025, we've got a forecast deficit of nearly 3 million um, tons of, of um, wood biomass per annum um, in, in the uh, uh, bioenergy area, so um, th this scheme is, is to grow productive trees between the ages of 10 and 15 years, species such as indicated on the screen, alder, aspen, eucalyptus poplar, and the grants that are available there for 15 years. So this is another scheme that's quite important. Okay, Tom, I think that might be a good uh, point for us to maybe stop uh, to, to run a quick poll with our audience. Um, I should also say that um, the, today's webinar is, is going to be recorded and will be available on the Chagas YouTube channel. And uh, we will also make the slides, uh, Tom's slides, available on the Chagas Connected uh, website. So that's chagas.ie forward slash connected. So uh, the first poll for today. Um, it is, uh, your, we want to get your views on what you believe are the most uh, suitable um, types of forest uh, for farms forestry. So we have, our first option is mainly conifer, broadleaf, agroforestry, uh, or forestry for fiber, as uh, Tom described earlier on there. So we'll just leave that poll open for 
uh, a few seconds there and just get your, your views in. So we're getting good, good interaction there. Um, it looks like we have a, a balanced here now. So we've um, we have 56% of participants are saying mainly conifer, uh, moving up to uh, and then to 20% are saying broadleaf, and then we have 20% are saying agroforestry. So that's an interesting uh, response there uh, from from our audience. Um, so, uh, what, what is the current breakdown, Tom, of forestry at a farm level in terms of the, the, the you know, the, the, the types of forestry? What's the main forestry that's being uh, put in on far farms? Yeah, well, in the in the mid in the recent midterm review, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine actually they um, in, in enhanced, particularly the the broadleaf and the diverse uh, species, the premium rates and the grants for those. So. Uh, there's been a, a marked increase, we'd say, in the likes of broadleaf and native woodland planting over the last couple of years, which is part of our um, co commitments, our national commitments. But there's still a, there's a good deal of planting of the more commercial conifers as well. So there is a, a mixture there. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on to the main um, point of our, our webinar here, the whole sustainability agenda. And let's, uh, let's talk about how uh, forestry can uh, contribute to the sustainable development of the Irish agri-food sector. So we'll just uh, share that back there. Perfect. Okay, so to, to get into the sustainability issues and what is sustainability and really it's the intersection of three key pillars, the environmental and you can see the climate, water quality and biodiversity. And I will cover those to a, a small degree, each of, each of those. There's the economic, um, side which is important also we, um, in terms of financial resources and there's the whole social side so um, the intersection of those is where we'll find sustainability and they are inter interdependent and I suppose the question um, is can forestry play a role in, in supporting these pillars um, so I'm, I'm just go to uh, firstly a very topical issue at the moment which is climate change and the question here is um, in terms of total carbon stock um, that can be accumulated from a forest and what are the processes there, we'll try and keep it simple. Um, what, what we're showing is the pathway to increase carbon stocks. This is a conifer for forest, but would you have maybe similar patterns in a broadly forest over three rotations. So if you look at the bottom, rotation one, rotation two, and rotation three. And if you look firstly at the green section of, of the slide, and you can see that th that's that's the actual forest level um, development of carbon stock. So over the three rotations, you you see it's it's um, a cycl cyclical pa pattern, but it also stays fairly constant over over that time. That's the managed forest um, carbon stock. Um, the second pathway to is is to the long term storage of the material coming from the forest into harvested wood products. So you can see there such as as um, export bound um, commercial timber which is quite valuable and that is, that is very significant you can see it's actually increasing over the rotation so it doesn't deplenish the more the more that's harvested it goes into this harvested wood product and it's a very important source it's, and it's well recognized in the accounting process the third uh, area in the in the blue is the uh, bioenergy replacement of fossil fuels and this is quite significant as well uh, as Tagus have analyzed the fourth area that needs maybe more effort, more work, is very important too. It's the substitution of energy intensive materials for wood. And there's very good work being done, for example, in and the National University in Galway in term, by Dr. Annette Hart in terms of developing very um, structurally um, sound um, ways, um, cross laminated timber technologies that can go into buildings. So that's, that's quite important. So there are the four processes. And I, I suppose the take home message as well is if you look at the dashed black line um, here in, 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 in the slide, that's the carbon stock development for an unmanaged forest. And we'll see af after three rotations where, where it, 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 it um, um, arrives at. And if, and if we compare it to the overall carbon stock for a managed forest, there's a big message jumping out there. Forest management is key here, and appropriate sustainable management is key. So I think this is a this tells a, a very important story here. So you've the managed and unmanaged. Maybe 
between four and five times the, the, the difference here. Okay, so um, this, this slide um, it gives um, a recent collaborative analysis on indicative sequestration rates for, for a couple of different forest types because that's a question people are, often ask. Now it's important to say these are potential values and there's a range of assumptions included here. Um, and these values are normalized to an average carbon sequestration rate over two hectare, sorry, over two rotations. And why we're doing this is it allows for like, with like comparisons for different species and different rotations. Um, the values include, like we saw on the last slide, the on-site forest emissions and removals, the removals from half the wood products, and the um, emission avoidance by substitution of fossil fuel energy. So there are the three areas. It doesn't include the, the substitution of energy intensive materials. Um, so we can see that coming, coming out with, with the highest sequestration would be the, the, the forest type that's mainly conifer. Um, so it, again, the, these are indicative between 4.5 and maybe over 10 uh, tons of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year. That's averaged over two rotations. Fast growing broadleaves are quite significant as well, between 3.5 and 6. And the slower grown broadleaves, such as oak, between 2.5 and 3. Now, it's important to say that as well as carbon, we also need to take into account the, the other ecosystem services that, that each species provide. But there is a message that productive forestry will give you good sequestration rates. So I'm moving on to the, to the agricultural sector, which isn't my, isn't my speciality area, but just uh, maybe one slide here, and I think I think the, the message is clear that um, sustainability is a big issue for Irish ag agriculture. We are exporting between 80 and 90 percent of our dairy and beef products, but we have, with our grass-based system, we have competitive av advantages, and it's embedded in our international food marketing as well. The message from this slide is simple, that we already have very efficient systems in terms of greenhouse gases per kilo of meat or milk. So that's really all I want to say there. But there's more challenges ahead. And what are those challenges? Yeah, the climate challenge here. Um, and under the, the Paris Agreement, there, there's a specific target set, and that target is a 30% reduction um, in our emissions relative to, to 2005 levels. Um, the 2005 level is 18.7 million tonnes of carbon equivalent. Um, the, measured in 2016, it was 19.24, and I think the challenge is that with higher animal numbers, there is an increasing trend. So that's setting us basically a, a significant challenge um, for cl climate change. Um, in, in order to pr provide uh, guidance, Togas has produced a, a marginal abasement co cost curve, an updated one in 2018. And what is this simply is it's a way of assessing our mitigation options and it's also looking at their efficiency and their costs. And I won't go into detail on, on this, but I'll show one of the pathways um, that has been identified is, is mitigation pathway two, which covers land use, land use change in forestry. It's called Lulu CF in short. And again, what's jumping out of this slide is that the take home message, a very significant cost effective contribution by forestry um, per annum. 2.1 million tons of, of carbon dioxide between the period of 2021 and 2030. Why, why is it, why is it uh, actually uh, cost effective? It's because it's below the assumed price of carbon credits, which is about 50 euro per ton. Um, so that is very significant and it's been acknowledged. But the other challenge is that the forestry is measured using a 20 year window. And the current level of planting we have is, 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 is low, and but it will have a significant impact on the post-2030 commitment period. And, and another message is that there's a significant increase required in planting rates uh, in order to maintain our mitigation capacity. So I think that that's very important to acknowledge. And do we have any fix on what sort of quantum of an increase that would be required there? Uh, maybe it's an unfair question to be asking now, but uh, to to offset some of those uh, likely uh, increases in, in greenhouse gas emissions from the agricultural sector? Well, obviously, the higher the better. We'd like to move the planting rates up to, I think, the, the analysis under the MAC curve was 7,000 hectares per annum, but we'd like to move it up to maybe 14,000 or 15,000. 
but I, I think the message and maybe from the, the remaining slides is that there are there are opportunities there on, on many farms and, and we, we have a quick look, look at those opportunities just just to remind our audience uh, if you want to submit your questions uh, that I can pose to uh, Tom at the end of the presentations please do use your question tab on the right hand side there and uh, we will get them to them after the, the the presentation okay so that's the 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 carbon side I'm going to move on briefly to the, the water quality side um, and the protection of water is a key component in the Department of Agriculture and Foods uh, and Marine um, assessment for licensing of all forest operations. And you can see there there is just specific protocols and guidelines in place in terms of the environmental requirements. There's woodland for water initiatives and there's policy regarding reforestation. So if they are strictly adhered to, um, we'll have very good out outcomes. And I'm just going to touch briefly, and this could have this is a measure that could have fairly wide application um, not just in forestry but maybe across agriculture maybe for built environments and just to give it an, an idea of what's involved here is is com combining near water courses undisturbed water setbacks and new native woodland which kind of a, a, a very strong um, effect in protecting and enhancing water quality this is the woodland for water measure here and then you, you've got the adjoining land use it could be agriculture it could be forestry it could be the built environment and just to take you through the, 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 the different elements, so A is the actual uh, water body, B is the undisturbed water setback. This, this would be un, uncrossed by drains, largely unplanted, except for maybe a few suitable uh, riparian trees um, in, in small groups or individually. And then C is this strip of native woodland. And again, this can be 20, 25 meters upwards. Again, it's uncrossed by drains. It can be strategically widened, depending on the adjoining land use, de de depending on the hydrology, depending on the slope of the land. Um, and again, it's a, it's a buffering that will, um, I suppose, remove any risk for, for, for the receiving water course. And D is, is, the, is the built environment, and there's possible interventions here with existing drains to break any potential pathways from the source to the receiving water course and it can create as we see here on the slide uh, pocket wetlands and maybe settlement areas so i think that's a very useful system that could be applied relatively widely and it's been developed recently by the department of agriculture food and the marine in conjunction with a range of stakeholders and is that available now tom is it it is yeah and okay. it's available under the native woodland establishment okay. scheme that i that i described briefly Another scheme that isn't out yet, but it's being, I understand, it's being um, finalized uh, in, within the department, is described in, in this document here, Forest and Water. And just very simply, it's called Environmental Enhancement of Forests. And we see here in the picture, maybe we have uh, pre-1990, maybe some of the older forests there that would have been um, planted closer to water courses. And this scheme would support various actions within existing forests, that will bring about structural changes that will proactively protect the water course. So you can see here a retrofitting of a buffer. So I understand this will be one of the measures possibly being considered in, in this scheme. Um, particularly on sensitive sites could be very useful and, and it could also increase water quality, biodiversity, con habitat connectivity, a range of benefits. So that's the water quality. Again, I'm just being brief there. Um, biodiversity is, is the other area. Um, how can we enhance forest biodiversity? And I think the key here, I've mentioned it before, well-sited, well-planned, and well-maintained forests are important. Within, across all, all forestry planting, there, there's a requirement for an inclusion of 15% broadleaves. There's also a requirement to include areas for biodiversity enhancement. Examples are shown there, another 15%. So in any new forest, we're looking at up to 30% of the area that would be very positive for um, biodiversity and other ecosystem services. Um, implement sustainable forest management, and we can look at forest edge management, creating wildlife corridors. Tinning is very important, as we've seen, for vigor and for sustainable growth, and even uh, applying the, the uh, environmental enhancements or forest scheme that will come out um, shortly will be important as well. Now, I'm going to move on to the financial uh, sustainability. And again, we, we provide um, information to far farmers that in terms of maybe forestry as a complementary farm crop. 
and we don't see forestry as competing. We see it as part of the farm, an integral enterprise within the farm. It can be used to optimize um, uh, returns from marginal land, diversification of farm enterprises. In, in many cases, it, it can be eligible for the basic payment scheme. Income tax free, um, so very tax efficient, a high rate return on any labor, and so and a capacity to significantly enhance farm viability. And I just one, one or two sharp little, little case studies, but first, again, we're comparing a productive, um, diverse spruce conifer forest on the left hand side with a fast growing broadleaf forest on the, on the right hand side. These are indicative returns, again, a range of assumptions. So we're looking at a total of eight hectares in each case and normal management, a rotation for the conifers about 34 years, a rotation for the broadleaves about 50 years. And what's the, what's the main take home message here? The annual equivalent value, which is, can be as an, at an indicative level compared maybe to gross margin, about 525 for the diverse conifers and about 355 for the broadleaves. Both, both are quite good, so it just shows the comparison. So that annual equivalent value, that, that's taking the total uh, income from the, the forest yeah. over its entire lifespan and dividing that by uh, its, uh, its life cycle. Exactly. So this net present value is actually, we look at all the future returns and the future costs. We, we bring them back to today's value and then we express it, as you say, in, in annual terms. That's the annual equivalent value. So I use a few formula for that because forestry is a long term crop. I mentioned case studies and, and this is, we have a couple of, of positive stories here that we, we'd just like to share in a couple of slides. Um, this is Mike Loans, he's a, a dairy farmer from Kilkenny um, and his farm includes two hectares of forest that were mainly conifer as you can see from the, the aerial shot that was uh, planted by his late father 29 years ago. And Mike was in the happy position recently of being able to harvest and it got a very attractive return it's, it, his story is available um, on our website. It's also available on the YouTube channel, the Tagus YouTube channel. What's the take home point here? That the income tax returns that, that Michael received, he was very happy with the overall return. Um, it can be put to many uses. So, Michael mentioned future education of his family. It could also be looked at as maybe sustainable investment on the farm. So I think you know there's, there's positive messages and there's positive approaches there. As you can you can see the link uh, that you can see it, uh, see your his story for yourself. A second case study inv involves another Kilkenny man, so they're they're quite strong in the focus today. Uh, this this is um, Andrew O'Carroll. He's um, another progressive uh, Kilkenny farmer, and he combines dry stock farming. He combines glass part participation and farm forestry and. Andrew won the Tagus Sponsored Farm Forestry Award as part of the RDS Spring Awards that promote sustainable farming and living in Ireland. For, and he, he won this award for excellence in, in it, integrating forestry on his farm. So he established a highly productive forest on an old farm um, on challenging marginal land. He's using the premium from that forestry to lease in better land close to his holding. And, um, and overall, his returns are better, optimizing his returns. And I think this can be an approach that people sometimes maybe can, can, don't, don't, but could look outside the box. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, different approaches for this would be quite important. Um, just one or two other slides on the environmental side. And we mentioned the, the native woodland scheme. And, and you know, there, there, there is quite a lot of interest in, in, in this. And to complement the native woodland scheme, the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine have recently launched a woodland environmental fund. And what is this? It's an access point for businesses, small and large, to link in with farmers, join in the effort to expand Ireland's native woodland resource. They provide additional funding and additional incentive to encourage planting up to about a thousand euro per, per hectare. And what do the businesses um, achieve it's a crop, crop ideal and I suppose corporate social responsibility project it contributes to the delivery of tangible environmental assets and um, the, the businesses are building social cohesion so people associated with the businesses such as employees customers trading partners they can feel part of a collective effort here so it's it's, it's a very good initiative I think it's a woodland environmental fund 
the final leg of the stool, social sustainability, and I'm finishing up here now. Um, so we see that a non-farm forest, again, the planting of forest is completely down to the individual. We give them the information to make informed decisions, but there's 12,000 people employed, spread evenly in every region. The, the output from the forestry sector is set to double in the next 10 to 15 years. And this expansion will be largely by farm forestry, um, IBEC tell us that it could create an additional 10,000 jobs and an additional 2 billion in economic activity. Now, is there is there opp other opportunities? Now, just a, a, a couple of, of slides here. Is there an opportunity for growth in rural areas? And we're looking at development opportunities here. And uh, an advisory colleague of mine comes from North Kilkenny, and you've got the Castle Comer Discovery Park. And that's a social community enterprise integrated within a forest that gets 120,000 visitors per year. It's one of the large attractions in the southeast. Uh, zip lining and a whole range of activities in combination with the forestry resource. That's one example. And the second example, um, it's from Muldenahoe in, uh, in, in County Tipperary. It's called Crocanore, a holiday home development, a music venue, walking trails, and it's integrated into a farm forest. And I, I believe it's very successful. So it just shows other examples, um, you, could, you could have biking trails, walking trails. We're looking at the moment at um, 10.3 um, million visitors to Ireland each year. And that maybe in, 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 in regional areas, integrating other activities into forestry could be a big winner, I think. Mm -hmm. So my final slide summary, I think farm forestry, it's a very significant ally in the quest for agricultural sustainability. And we're looking at farm viability. We're looking at helping climate mitigation in a big way water quality and biodiversity with the proper application of, the, of, of schemes and even local development. And what are the drivers? Looking at whole farm planning, where can forestry fit in the farm, well-sited and, and planned farm forest, appropriate species and planter categories to promote the sustainable growth, ongoing management and, and opportunities for multiple use and added value. So I suppose they're the kind of messages and I'd like to, uh, to just put across today. I'm sure it gives some food for thought. So, Tom, you've uh, put up a few links there on our screen. On the screen, they'll be available on the website. And um, it struck me actually the amount of reports uh, that have been done on farm forestry uh, in the country. It's quite uh, uh, quite amazing the, the amount of uh, you know research that has been done on the the uh, the native woodland side of things. But you you talked about the sustainability, uh, the social sustainability at the end, and we have heard you know from different parts of the country that. Uh, some people aren't all that pleased about uh, forestry uh, expanding in their region. Um, but uh, in your later slides, there you have shown that actually, you know, forestry doesn't have to be a a monoculture uh, that that doesn't have uh, social benefits. But what would, how would you, how would you respond to those concerns that you know are often genuine uh, that people are are concerned about the the impact that forestry would have on their region? Yeah. And I, I think I, I think it's important to, to listen to people. Uh, I know that the, the Minister of State, Andrew Dyle, has commissioned a, a survey, we'll say, in, in, the, in the north um, western area, look at, looking at the economic side, but also the social side, and that will get feedback from people. It's important to hear their views. Mm -hmm. Our focus would be on the farm forestry sector, and I think that, um, uh, and maybe we've seen from the slides there, if it's well managed, it's, it's a very valuable resource. And over, over a number of years, even as short as 10 years, it can grow considerably in, in value and um, it can be a very important resource on the, on the farm. So that, that would be our focus. But we, we would say as well that you know, um, good planning, good, uh, well-sited forests you know, can have a major positive impact. Very good, very good. So I was getting back to the theme of today's uh, webinar. It's about the sustainability uh, from a I suppose an environmental point of view. Um, the uh, we have a question in here from one of our uh, audience uh, participants. Uh, it's, it's talking about the issue of sedimentation of water bodies, and it's uh, uh, the question here is: Can you suggest mitigation around forestry that was planted in areas that might pose a threat to water quality? Uh, a number of catchments in our, Ireland. Uh, have shown a drop in water quality post-harvest. So um, 
you know, are there measures uh, there uh, that to, to mitigate that Im the impact of, of sediment uh, runoff? Yeah, well, I suppose th th there's, a, there's a number of measures that, that, that can be considered there. Uh, I think I showed on the slide, th there's the environmental, in environmental requirements for forestry, but also the felling requirements. So strict adherence to those would be important. Um, depending on, on the forest type, maybe that new scheme there, um, environmental enhancement of forests, where before there's any harvesting or felling, that uh, if there's support for the retrofitting of, a, of a, an effective buffer, mm -hmm. that will um, mitigate any potential risks from sediment or, or even nutrients as well. And again, the woodland, for new plantations, the woodland for water is something that maybe that can, can can be considered particularly on sensitive sites. So is that that, that uh, enhancement, forestry enhancement, is that available to all yes. forests? Um, well, um, we haven't the details yet. It, it will be, it will, I, I understand it, it will, it will, it's being finalized and it will be brought out um, maybe initially to, to, I suppose, to, to provide a resource for maybe sensitive areas. Mm -hmm. But we haven't the details, so I can't really comment. Um, more okay. on that. We have a, a more local question here. It says, if a farmer plants native woodland species after f the 15 years, will uh, payment be available for conserving the woodland? So after planting for, uh, for after 15 years. So I suppose the question relates to the thinning that's available there for, uh, or that takes place for, for uh, more coniferous forestry. This is related to native woodland species. The native woodland conservation scheme is 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 uh, targeted at existing forests, so it could be um, a forest that has been on the farm for quite a, a long time, and it, it involves works such as maybe uh, uh, excluding stock that might be grazing the natural vegetation, um, improvement felling, um, working close with nature. So the conservation scheme would be for for um, existing forests. The, the establishment scheme is for new forests. Um, so we have a question here, another question says, private forest owners need more information on felling license requirements. The new requirements are holding up applications and slowing down timber mobilization. Uh, there is a role for Chagask, uh, this uh, viewer believes, then, um, in helping forest owners understand their responsibilities. Okay. Um, like I've shown uh, maybe in the, one of the early slides in terms of our, our activities, we have a, we run a range of events during the year and without plugging too much, that we, um, between the 29th of April and the 9th of May, we've got a countrywide series of farm management walks that are coming up. Now they can deal with, it, with any issues, so it might be an opportune time. And we are aware that, uh, you know, filling license issues, the information needs to get out to owners as well. So. Um, those events are coming up and we'd encourage people to attend but we are available as well I've got eight advisory colleagues um, located um, strategic, strategically around the country and they're available at all times for interaction be it phone consultation office consultations and where, where appropriate um, site visits as well we've got a whole range of um, knowledge transfer tools there's a lot of information on our website um, www.tagus.e forest slash forestry. We get uh, the e news data coming out very, uh, very regularly. And also, we're going to have, um, I think in June, um, two talking timber events which deal with timber marketing. And also, there'll be information there available on the forestry felling license regulations. You mentioned the forestry e, e newsletter. How does how does one sign up for that, or how is that is that a free a free newsletter? It's it, it's it's a free newsletter, so you you can go onto the website and and sign sign up for it. Okay. We have application forms at events as well, so if people are interested, maybe contact your local Tagus um, staff, and they will get you signed up. So it's very useful if there's events coming up, if there's new measures coming out, if there's um, topical information pieces, they'll be included in the newsletter and a very good source of information. Right, we're getting lots and lots of questions here, so we better concentrate here on and try and get it, getting through as many of the questions as, as possible here. Um, okay, so we have a question here. It says, do you foresee any possibility of forestry owners being in a position to trade carbon credits to other intensive farms or businesses? 
or uh, what's the thinking around that at the moment? Will that be at a local level, or is it is it likely to be at a national level? Well, I, I, it's it's at a national level. So um, under the requirements under the UN framework for climate change, there there is a reporting obligation by by the, the state to report um, changes in, in, in climate um, in greenhouse gases for forests and, and land use so that, that would be at, at a national level um, and it's also a requirement by the within the Paris agreement um, as well as that we, we know that there's grants and premiums available for forestry um, forestry is not part of the emissions trading scheme is the non non ETS okay. Okay. So, so until that happens really that that trading isn't going to be possible. There, there, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a regulated um, trading scheme, but that means people are, can still look at voluntary schemes. Um, in England, you've got the Woodland Carbon Code. I think they they are open to vo voluntary schemes. There isn't a regulated trading uh, trading scheme that I'm aware of. But in that particular instance, the the value of the carbon isn't actually realised, is it? Or is it is it possible that one can get credit for that uh, that that forestry? In the, in the UK scenario you described there, um, it, yeah, it's a voluntary system where there are payments for. Um, again, it's like a bit like the the, okay. um, the woodland environmental fund. It's, it's an extra payment um, for establishment of new native woodland. Okay, okay, very good. So um, the next question we have is uh, so just a more generic question here. It says, how does the public know if a new forest is proposed in their area? And what can they do if they have any questions about it? That's a really good question. Okay, so there is there's a couple of processes here. Um, so if, if an application is put in for a, a, a new forest enterprise, um, it's it's on the department's website, um, the, the the area involved and, and the townland. But there's also in recent times there's a requirement for a site notice. Um, so that would be on the the, the site. When the application goes in, the site notice is, is mandatory for five weeks after that. Um, and since the various applications are also published in, in, the, in the local press, and if people want to comment, um, it, it's through the Department of, of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, the forestry section in Johnstown Castle. Okay, okay, very good. Um, question in relation to agroforestry here, um, saying that it, it is still quite niche. Um, can you summarize what might uh, the main barriers for adoption be and how it compares with other types of forestry in terms of sustainability and profitability? So that's a uh, two, two pronged question. Okay, so um, it's the, the idea is you're, you're growing um, high quality timber and you're combining it with, um, in a silvopastoral situation, you're combining it with maybe sheep or, 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 or and eventually maybe light cattle. Um, it's very good in terms of the, the animal welfare that uh, reports and studies have shown that you know there's actual it helps live weight gain in animals. There's a good welfare situation. Um, the the stocking of trees, the minimum is 400 trees per hectare. So these have to be well managed over the rotation of, of, of the forest. So we'll say if it's a fast growing um, broadleaf tree or a slow growing broadleaf tree, there are management interventions uh, such as formative shaping and making sure that the trees are growing vigorously and healthy, that you've got good straight, straight um, lower stems that will make up the, the valuable crop at the end. How do you compare it with other forestry? We'll say in term I gave figures for the carbon sequestration. So we'll say with, with fast grown broadleaves, um, it's up to six tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per annum. With, with a slow growing, it's up to three. The agroforestry, because there's a, a lower um, stocking of trees, um, the, the sequestration rate would be a bit lower than that. And then it, it depends as well. You have to factor in if there's livestock, um, whatever type, what what emissions are there as well. So you have to balance that out. In terms of, of returns, again, it will depend on the species that's growing. Um, if if it's a, a slow growing broadleaf tree, the returns will be over a long term, and you're basically looking at maximising the quality if, if there's a broadleaf crop. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Tom. Uh, another question in here. Um, what would be an ideal amount of forestry to plant on a farm? 
Um, so uh, let me see, just, sorry, that has skipped through for us here. So what is the ideal amount of forestry to plant on a farm and what are the returns from timber harvesting? Returns from timber harvesting. Um, the, the ideal area, again, that, that's, that's context specific and, and site specific. So um, we, we would suggest that um, in terms of whole farm planning, to, to look at optimizing the different types of, of, of soils that are available and, 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 and land use. And again, it's down to the owner's objectives. There's grant aid available for a broadleaf forest for an area as low as 0.25 of a hectare for a conifer, it's one hectare. But I suppose you need to balance the economies of scale as well and see what, what areas of land are available to you. How can you maximize the overall um, design in, into your forest? Mm. So if you're looking at e economies of scale, um, sometimes people would say that maybe a, a number of hectares are required, we'll say in a commercial forest, um, you're looking at maybe six to eight hectares would, would be maybe a, a decent size in terms of getting future harvesting infrastructure in, in place. But it can vary and people have different objectives. It could be a broadly forest to enhance the visual design, provide shelter on the farm, provide a whole range of ecosystem services. And we've got, I think we're profiling in, in the media next week, a lady in the North Kerry Limerick area who's, who, who's gone for boat a, de a design mixing four hectares of oak with a number of hectares of commercial as well, um, a background in tourism and planning eco-tourism on the farm and trails in the future as well. So it's really context specific. Yeah, very good, very good. And just on the, 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 the timber side of it, uh, what are the returns from, from timber harvesting? Again, I suppose dependent on the the, the type of uh, species that are being planted, I imagine. Yeah, um, no, broad leaves, depending on, on their rotation, are going to take, you know, they're going to be, be quite va valuable. You, you're into hundreds of euro per tonne or per cubic metre, but they'll take a, a quite, a, quite a bit of time. Um, why people plant a commercial element on the farm is sometimes is that you've got a, a shorter rotation for some of the species, and we actually were looking at case studies in 2018, um, and there was record prices paid for some of, of, of the timber that was that was uh, harvested, um, varying between 55 and maybe up to 80 um, euro per, per cubic meter coming out. And what was the main driver for that, or was it just a, a supply issue? Or? Um, there's a, there's a, we, we have, I suppose, Brexit concerns, but we still are next door to the second largest timber market in the world uh, that's taking in huge amounts of timber and their specifications are aligned with Ireland's very closely. So it, it, Brexit issues aside, it's a huge market. And in terms of our sawmill, um, there's been strategic investment in our sawmills over the last 10 years. And some of them are the most technologically advanced in the world are one of the most advanced in the world. So there's good infrastructure there. There is very good infrastructure there. I thought for the, for a moment we were going to have uh, our first webinar without mentioning the, the, the Brexit word. Maybe but, I shouldn't uh, have it. It slipped in there. Um, another question here. Can the distance, be, distance between trees be adjusted to widen access for mowers, etc., by increasing stocking in planting line in agroforestry? Now it's a very specific question to agroforestry. Yeah, the, the, I, I, I would say, no, I can't speak for the Department of Agriculture, but I, the, the, I know that they're looking definitely at, at flexibilities. So at the moment, um, there's a number of pilot agroforestry um, enterprises around the country, and um, the owners are very happy with them. We've actually been on, on a number of them, and generally you're looking to date at five meters between rows of trees. Um, now I presume with um, lo local contact with, with the department that, that, that there can be some flexibilities as long as the stocking is maintained. Um, the five meters is 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 a is, is a, a good spacing. If there is a requirement for it wider, again I'd say I would say local consultation with the, with the department. I'm sure there would be some flexibilities there. Okay, very good. It strikes me when you you talk about you know the, the, you're responding to a question there about um, you know the decision to to take on farm forestry uh, uh, for a, a farmer that really 
there, there's a there's a wider process that needs to take place they're looking at the various enterprises that, that there's a whole farm planning approach that's needed there where there's there's maybe consultation with the farm advisor the main advisor and the the forestry advisor is that how is that working out in practice um, it, it, it works out very well in that we, we link in with our um, agricultural advisors around the, the country and we say in, in the case of, of Andrew or Carol, the RDS winner, Andrew um, would have linked in with his dry, dry stock advisor and the dry stock advisor in cons consultation with, with um, the forestry advisor can provide uh, holistic uh, advice mm -hmm. and the whole farm planning approach is looking at optimizing what's on the farm and as, as I said and it's important to repeat we don't see forestry competing at all an additional um, sustainable resource that can be very um, attractive for landowners so it's about diversifying diversifying in the right areas and with the proper planned approach very good very good um, from a financial point of view, you know, how does forestry interact with other farm schemes? It's a question we're, we're often asked. You mentioned yeah. about the, uh, the the basic payment scheme. Yeah. Is that still available to somebody who opts to go for forestry, or is that is that only up to, available up to a certain point? Um, it, it's available um, over quite a number of years now, and it, it's available under the current forestry program. And speaking to landowners, I, I would I would think that they'll hope that it, it's a, a continuation rollover. Um, but we know it's available up to 2020. Um, so if if you're planning some new forestry, uh, it's important to maybe consult with your advisor and to make sure you're eligible. That forestry is eligible. In most cases, it, it can be eligible. Uh, you have to go back to, to, to 2008 as a reference year and make sure the land you're planting um, was was eligible and was paid on in that year and also retain a certain amount of land in, in an agricultural enterprise. So a lot of people, it's a, it's a major bonus for people planting to have the forestry grant, the forestry premium and the basic payment on the same parcel of land. But just to check in advance that eligibility is actually verified. Okay. And when you say 2020, does that mean that it's the payments are up to 2020 or that somebody who plans before 2020 is eligible for this? The, the availability of the basic payment uh, scheme in terms of forestry being an, an eligible crop is, is in place at the moment under the current um, round but it, again it has to be verified in the next round of cap okay of course yeah. yes yeah. yeah sure that that is a decision within yeah. the the yeah. each round of the cap okay look i think we're going to leave it there we have uh, received lots and lots of questions from you so um if you do have any more questions uh, yeah. subsequent to the uh, the webinar you can email them to uh, tom.hulahan at uh, chagas.ie yeah. uh, or indeed if you want to email them to connect it at chagask.ie. Just before we go, I just want to let you know that uh, we have a number of other uh, webinars coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks. Um, on the 30th of April, uh, we have uh, Michael Hennessy and uh, Stephen Kilday from Chagask uh, speaking about serial disease control and how we can manage today's threats for future control. And then on the 7th of May, we have Noel Meehan uh, from the Chagask Water Quality Programme uh, discussing New Zealand's approach to catchment management and water quality. Uh, just a reminder again that today's webinar is recorded and will be available uh, for download on the Chagask uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we will also uh, make the presentation available uh, for you to download on a PDF. Uh, if you just visit chagask.ie forward slash connected, uh, you will receive, uh, you'll be able to download a copy of the presentation. Presentation. So once again, thanks to our guest today, Tom Houlihan, for joining us. Thank you, Tom, for an excellent overview of the uh, the role that forestry can play in the, the, the future sustainable development of agriculture in Ireland. And I'm sure you'll get plenty of calls uh, uh, for further information after this, uh, this webinar. So thank you to all of our participants for joining us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. And uh, as I said, uh, you can look back and we will contact you over the next number of days uh, with the, the recording. We'd also uh, invite you to uh, uh, fill out a feedback form that we uh, will email to you as well. We really want to get your feedback and see how we can improve these webinars. And indeed, if there are any other topics that you'd like to see covered over the, the coming months and years. 
with that, uh, we'll, we'll wind things up and uh, thank you once again. Goodbye.